Wow. Isn't Jesus beautiful? Isn't he glorious and marvelous? Isn't he wonderful? When his presence comes, doesn't it change everything? Do you know he's moving in our nation at the moment? Right here, right now, in this nation. He's moving all across the nation. It struck me a couple of weeks ago that we get this privilege of seeing a tiny glimpse, a window into what he's doing across our nation at the moment. And he's stirring people, friends. He's awakening people. He's stirring hearts and he's awakening minds and he's opening ears and he's beginning to speak really clearly, (laughs) sometimes a bit scarily. He's moving in our nation. I just want to tell you that because sometimes if we're faithfully sowing into what he's asked us to do in front of us, we don't get to see the bigger picture. And if you're not yet seeing it, you can trust that if you want in, he's coming and he won't leave you out. He won't leave you out. He's at work in our nation today, friends. This time, this place, this moment that he's got you alive for, he's working. (laughs) We're going to dive into the word today and into Matthew 26. And it's this little passage. And um, friends, as I was preparing this word, there were moments where I felt like, this is a bit much, Lord. (laughs) This is a bit much. (laughs) And woe to me who thinks what is dangerous and what is safe is not at equilibrium with what the Lord says is dangerous and what is safe, hey? Because we have our our understanding of things, and Jesus rewrites those things. But I just want to say to you today that as I open the word, and as we speak these words, that this, it feels like the Lord gives us these, um, these moments in life, these times where we can opt in or opt out. But when he speaks those things, he gives us the grace to do so. There's a grace in the room to opt in today. And I feel like that's what the Lord is saying this week, is that there's a, there's a week of decision that's been, and there's a week of like unearthing decisions that we've already made, stakes we've already put in the ground, lines that we've already stepped over, and sometimes um, opposition comes, right? And it's hard to say yes to the Lord, but we're going back and we're dusting off and we're remembering, no, we've decided to follow Jesus, we're all in. And so today, as we open the word... I just want to remind you that there is grace in the room to opt in to him today. We're going to dive into Matthew 26. And um, James, if you could help me get the passage up, that would be amazing, because then we can read it together. Um, We're going to start at verse 3. And it says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and to kill him. But not during the festival, they said. Or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. And truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, What she has done will also be told in memory of her. I feel like in this passage we see a controversial Jesus, right? We're quite far into the Gospels and the Lord is in the room and between these two groups of people are two very different responses. One wants to pour out her everything in worship before him. And one wants to erase him from the face of the earth. 
This is a controversial man. This is the controversy of Jesus Christ. And if we go before to, to the two chapters that frame this passage um, before, I feel like the scriptures are so good at, um, where shall I put this, uh, um, at opening up for us um, a framing of things. Like when we pick out a passage, let's pick out the passage before and the passage after, because so often it paints a bigger picture. And the two chapters before, Jesus is just talking about the end times, one after the other, these allegories of the end times. And I feel like the question that he's asking his disciples, and it's only his disciples he's asking, he's saying, are you in? Are you in or are you out? And it starts at 24.6. It says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pains. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other. And because of the increase of wickedness, many whose love they've had will grow cold but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved are you in or are you out will your love grow cold he goes on the day and the hour is unknown of these things but about that day or hour no one knows except the father two men will be in a field one will be taken and the other not are you in will you follow then he talks about the ten virgins, five are ready for him and five are not. Friends, there is no grey area. There's no like, oh, they were, they were hoping to get the oil. Well, are you in? Are you ready? Or are you not? Then there's the bags of gold. Do we recognize what we've been given to steward? Will we be ready for the master's return? Are you in? Or are you not? And he finishes, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And I feel like if I was a disciple in this moment in time, I would be terrified. <laughs> am I in or am I not? Am I in? Do I really believe? How far will I go? Am I in? And he paints this picture of eternity across two chapters, one story after another, and none of them are comfortable, and none of them are convenient. And he's painting this picture and reminding us, this is the narrow way, friends. And it's only getting narrower. And I imagine there are small questions in the disciples' heads. The big ones are like, will, will, I, will I be picked at the end? And the small ones are like, how much am I willing to give today? Am I aligned with what he said? Am I in or am I not? And they've been walking with him really closely for three years. They're well aware of the controversy of his presence. See, the longer Jesus is in the room, the more he opens his mouth, the more is seen of him, the more is seen of his life, the more is heard from his words, the more reaction he gets. And this reaction is growing now. This reaction is growing in the public. And we see this narrative continue as the picture of Matthew's gospel now hones in back on what's going on around them. It's end times, end times, end times. Are you in? Are you in? Are you in? Are you in? 26 verse 3. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. John 11:48 says here is this man Jesus performing many signs if we let him go on like this everyone will believe in him and then the romans will come and they'll take away both our temple and our nation i.e. if we let Jesus go on if we allow Jesus to be who he is we'll lose our land we'll lose our power structures we'll lose our politics we'll lose our influence we'll lose our customs our traditions everything we are everything we have we will lose everything we must get rid of him or everything we have will be lost 
But we're talking about a controversial Jesus here. And we've looked at a passage where two, pe- two groups of people react so differently. And they're all framed in light of eternity. So we can only assume that the other will react so differently. Mary comes in. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. The Passion Translation says, she came into the house holding an alabaster jar filled with expensive fragrant oil. She came right up to Jesus and in a lavish gesture of pure devotion, she poured out the costly oil and it cascaded over his head as he was at the table. The scriptures say, this perfume is worth a whole year's wages. It represented her career or her job, her worldly goods, her wealth, her reputation, her standing, her position, her stature in society. She's pouring it out, pouring it out, pouring it out. Some scholars say that this alabaster jar would have been given to her at birth and it would have been given to her to um, hold on the shelf until she meets the man that she wants to marry. That's both her inheritance and her destiny. That's all of her devotion, her forever love. That's her joy, her commitment. Poured out, poured out. And she's pouring, she's pouring. Some scholars have talked about the fact that just a week before her dear brother Lazarus dies and at the time she has such faith that he won't die, that Jesus will come in time. And as it pans out, he actually dies and he's buried before Jesus arrives and brings him back from the dead. Maybe this alabaster jar represents her whole story. Every grief and every joy, every disappointment, every questioning, every testimony and every glory pouring it out. She's pouring it out. Everything she is and everything she has on this man, Jesus. Friends, it's not even like the room gets it. The room doesn't get it. These are people she knows and they don't get her devotion. They don't understand the passion with which she pours. The scriptures say the room's indignant. They're offended. They even scold her harshly. What a total waste. And she's pouring. She's pouring freely. Pouring. Could this not have gone to the poor, one asks? Well, how wise that sounds. Do you know, even the devil knows scriptures. (laughs) But Jesus knows the motive of the heart. And he knows the motive of the heart of the one that says, could this not have gone to the poor? And he knows the motive of the heart of Mary. He sees it all. He sees them and he sees her. And he sees you and he sees me. Every vial poured out, every yes that's painfully given, every thought that's battled to the ground, he sees it all. And he receives it. She keeps pouring. Pouring, pouring. offensive. They're offended. And see, so often our faith in Jesus Christ can be tolerated as long as it's measured, as long as it doesn't ruffle too many feathers, interrupt too many conversations, as long as it doesn't challenge the way that people want to live their lives. It can be tolerated as long as you don't make it too uncomfortable for people. As long as it's not too passionate. As long as you don't live too extremely, it's okay. You can follow that Jesus. And we compromise and compromise to the voices in the room until a tepid life is okay to live under the banner of his name. But friends, the longer Jesus is in the room, the more controversial he gets. He's looking for all-in surrender. All in commitment. The more he teaches, the less comfortable, the less convenient following gets. Oh, the more glorious every step of the way. 
but only if we're willing to take him in light of eternity, of who he really is, only if we're willing to let go of the things that are temporarily in our hands. These gifts we've been given, they're gifts, friends, but if we hold them tightly, we won't make room for what's eternal. And Mary's here, and she's pouring it all out before him, and it's because she's made a decision in light of eternity. She has no regrets. It's not to gain his love either. We've talked about that. (laughs) He loves us so freely. It's already done. He loves you. He loves me. But he loves so furiously, so passionately, so jealously that he won't leave you where he met you. He wants it all. And giving our all is our own ticket to freedom. That's the crazy thing about it. That when we'll give our all to him, we can receive so much more in return. I've got a quote from C.S. Lewis here. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, this Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, Or else you would be a devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. So you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing sense that this this man was a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. And he did not intend to. See, the more we read of the Gospels, the more we understand who he is, the more we realize it's a question of, are we in? Are we in? Are we opting in? And for those Pharisees at the beginning of the of the passage, they're holding on to those temporal things of power and control and understanding, everything they understand of influence. And suddenly Jesus becomes a threat and they must get rid of him. And for us, it's so easy to get caught up in it, right? In how we're perceived in our families, our work parameters, even our financial goals. They're all gifts, friends. They're all gifts. But if we hold them too tightly, we won't make room for him. We're not opting in. Mary had those gifts, all those things. But she had the perspective of eternity set in her heart. She was already in. And as she poured out her unhindered devotion to him, she invested in eternity. You know, she, only, she didn't even just invest in her own eternity, but the Lord says that she prepared him for burial. She invested in the eternity of all of us. She prepared him for burial so that he could die and he could rise again in our place. Her investment in eternity is our salvation. I've got a great, great aunt, Edith Cavill. She was well known as a nurse in her time. But when she was a nurse, a world war broke out and she felt called to go to the front lines. And she was in Belgium. And she was in Belgium and she set up a practice and she refused to turn a patient away. 
And one after the other, she served these soldiers. But they weren't just English and they weren't just French, they were also German. She had this idea of life being beyond the lines of political opinion. She had a, a perspective of eternity. And she was well known in the nation because she was actually shot in the end. She was put to death because of it. She had no regrets. She walked um, her final morning. She invited a chaplain and she, she sang hymns. She worshipped God and she said, I have no regrets. Patriotism isn't enough. We must have no hatred or bitterness for anyone. She talked of her faith being the thing that held her. D.L. Moody was an evangelist from Chicago. He had no education, but early on in his life, he had this conversation with a guy called Vardley. And Vardley said, do you know D.L.? as he called him. Do you know, D.L., we are yet to see what God could do with one man who is fully consecrated to him. D.L.'s diaries go on to suggest that he wrestled with this for a few days. Really? I don't need an education? And then he said, I'll be that man. Let me be that man. Let me see what God does with one fully consecrated man. His legacy is a million souls across the nations. There's a guy um, that's talked about in a book from Zimbabwe. And um, this guy brought many people to know the Lord. He was eventually crushed for his belief in Jesus. But this is what he wrote beforehand. I'm part of a fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he comes, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he stops me. And then... When he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me because my banner will be clear. George Muller cared for 10,000 orphans in his time. He homed them all. He set up 117 schools, schooled 120,000 children in the Victorian era. He was even, um, sometimes people um, got upset with him because he, they felt like that he was bringing the poor above their station. <laughs> he preached in 34 countries over 17 years, and that was after his retirement. He began preaching at 71. <laughs> Every piece of finance that came into his hand was not asked for from man. He asked for it before the Lord. He didn't earn a thing. He just took it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we need food for these orphans today. And food would come. One day, after his legacy was well known, he was asked, what's the power behind your ministry? What's happened here? This was his response. There was a day, he said, when I utterly died. And as he spoke, he bent lower to the ground. I died to George Muller, his opinions, his preferences, his tastes and his will. I died to the world, its approval or its censure. I died to the approval or blame even of my own brethren and friends. And since then, I've studied only to show myself approved by God. He had the perspective of eternity. And it set legacy. Friends, these are all massive stories. <laughs> Life or death stories. And you know, we've got other friends. I've got a friend who's a doctor and he's committed to praying for his patients even though he's been taken to court for it because he believes that Jesus changes everything. 
We've got a friend who's 17 who went for two years of school without any friends to play with or hang out with at lunchtime because she was unwilling to move from her beliefs in Jesus Christ. Do you know what? Two weeks ago, she was in the room when one of the most influential kids in her school was brought to Christ. That's that legacy. And we don't always see it. There's a legacy in eternity that's left. We're all asked to give different things. But we are all asked to give it all. He only asks for everything. <laughs> Legacy is made when we start making decisions before the Lord first. Legacy is made when we start pouring out costly worship. Not because we ought to or we should, but because we've caught a glimpse of who he really is. This Jesus. Legacy is made when eternity becomes the frame through which we live. Jim Elliot says, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let's pray, friends. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the access you give us to your word. We thank you for the access you give us to the picture of eternity that you have, the bigger story. God, we're so grateful to have eyes to see the bigger story. Today we pray, Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to the bigger story? And in every place, God, where our eyes are hindered from seeing eternity, from stepping into a perspective of eternity as we make our decisions, God, would you take those things? Would you take those things from us? Lord, we pray that you would free us from the fear of man the understanding of what others perceive of us in a room. God, we pray that you would free us from the bondage of, of fear around failure. We pray that you'd free us from the fear around lack. God, that we would step into a place of ultimate trust, of ultimate worship, where we're able to give you our all because we trust you with it all. You are the trustworthy God. And we say when we let go of things to give to you, we are better off for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that when we bring you worship, when we bring you our all, you come and you free us. And we're able to give unhindered in a room. Lord, would you free us from all the things that would stop us, that would hinder us from giving our all. And we opt in today. We ask God, would you put a line in the sand? Would, would we be ones that give our yes today and make it a yes that is core to our very being? That every day that proceeds from here would come back to a marker in the sand we made today that said, we will give our yes in light of eternity. Help us, God. Open our eyes to see. Speak to our hearts, captivate our hearts, Jesus, the most beautiful man that's ever lived. We honor you today. We love you, Lord. Come and have